Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, as you mentioned, I'm the author of Cracking the PM Interview. So my background comes from actually an engineering background initially. So I was a software engineer for a while at Google where I did mostly software engineering interviews, but a few others, a few other types of interviews. Sometimes for some reason they put me interviewing very high up directors, which is kind of crazy when I'm like two years out of school, um, <laughs> which they love, by the way. Um, but so then, I, then I kind of switched gears and switched and went and started Career Cup, which is sort of a forum around interviewing. And that took my, me kind of down the interviewing route and started doing a lot of consulting. And so I mentioned that because some of the stories I'm going to talk about today are going to reference some of the consulting work I've done. So I do two types. One is working with companies on how to actually construct a hiring process. The other thing I do is I work with startups going through acquisitions to help them get ready for the acquisition interviews where they are more or less interviewing for their own jobs. And what that's allowed me to do is get this really interesting piece of insight that people rarely get, which is what happens when you interview somebody over and over and over again? How can you actually craft and change their story? And how does what they're saying actually map to what they're really doing on the job? Because usually when you interview somebody, you don't, you know, you, you hear their side of the story, you're not going off and talking to their managers and seeing, okay, is this really representative? And so it's given me this really re useful piece of kind of qualitative data. And so I'm going to reference some of the stories, some of the things I've seen, some of the specific people I've talked to throughout that journey. Uh, but today is going to focus on essentially how to do well in interviews. So we're going to start off with talking about, you know, kind of how to get a job as a PM, but what it actually takes to join as a product manager and start that. And that's going to work into how to craft your pitch. So at a high level, we can think about that the perfect PM has technical skills, at least if you're talking about technical uh, PM roles at technical companies. They have business school, so think about that as like not necessarily a formal MBA, that that's one route, but they understand the official business stuff, the marketing, this and that. They have good product skills, so they you know, know how to think about what do users want and actually design for that. Maybe they actually know how to do some steps of UI design. They can actually lead and execute, because what good is a product manager who can't actually lead? Uh, and then they also have industry skills. And what I mean by industry skills is it's specific to that role. So if you are looking at a product manager role at a uh, company that does you know, financial services products, well, industry skills are going to mean you have a finance background. So if you look at this, it is almost impossible for anybody especially anybody joining as a pro any you know, entry-level product manager to have all of these things. It's just, if you have one, you know, if you have a lot of technical skills, that's probably because you studied computer science, you were a developer, and that means you probably don't have some of these other areas covered. And so you really can't have that, especially early on in your career. But even people with more experience are going to be kind of lopsided here usually. And that's important to understand because, you know, it means that people can enter product manager the, that field from a lot of different directions. But this comes into how you think about how are you going to introduce yourself. So often interviewers start off with telling a bit about yourself or walking through your resume. And so you want to think about, well, they're kind of at a high level looking for some of these things. So you want to think about what of the you know, big buckets, what do you have, what do you need, and then this other piece, which a lot of people don't think of, which is, what am I going to assume about you? And so what I'm thinking about, not me, my computer's not hooked up. Um, so people are going to think about, you know, what, what, what am I going to assume about you? So what I'm talking about here, and I'm a pretty blunt person, is, you know, yes, maybe racial stereotypes, gender stereotypes, but what I'm really getting at actually is the stereotypes of you based on your background. So if you go into interview and you have your software developer for a while and this and that, your interviewer is probably going to assume, whether true or not, they're probably going to not think, yeah, but do they, or are they going to be one of those PMs who are scared of numbers? They're gonna be, yeah, developers, yeah, and then math, that's, that's fine. I don't know if they can actually design for what a user wants, but they know math. If you come from a background of a lot of design, it's going to be the opposite. They're going to say, okay, great. You probably understand what users want. You can do that, but, but are you going to be able to make business decisions? Are you going to understand math? And that Thinking about that, being realistic about what kind of stereotypes come in based on your background is really, really important for crafting a great pitch. So at a high level, this is what a good pitch looks like. You, you know, or at least a good enough pitch. You're basically just walking through your resume. S first sentence here is, 
you know, your interviewer asks you to tell me a bit about yourself. First sentence, sure, so I'm a product manager or whatever role at such and such company. My background's in computer science, did a bachelor's and master's in comput computer science at UPenn, and then I went to do X, Y, and Z, and then I did this, 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 and this. Walk through your resume, nothing crazy fancy. Big mistakes people make is they aren't quick enough here. So when you're preparing for interviews, regardless of how much experience you have, time yourself. It is, in fact, more often than not, people think they're giving me a short pitch of two minutes, and they're actually talking for six or seven minutes. So time yourself. It's really, really important. Uh, so that you want this to be fairly quick. Think about those you go through this. You know, this is not a tell your interviewer everything you've ever done. It's, it's you know, yes, it's a walkthrough, but it's fairly quick. But do you think about quick ways you can show success? So that can be, you know, something you launched. It can be a true accomplishment. But it, it's, what I'm broadly speaking about is things that will demonstrate to your interviewer that you've been successful in the past. So if you say, you know, spent, la spent you know, four years at Amazon doing X, Y, and Z, and then left when my old manager recruited me out to join his startup. The implicit statement there is, you were doing well enough at Amazon that your old manager, somebody who really, really knows you well, wanted you to come join them. That is a demonstration of success. Not an accomplishment, but it is a demonstration of success. So think about what kind of things can you work in there that demonstrate success. Third thing is, what do you want to talk to me about? Look, I, yes, I have your resume. I've hopefully looked at it. But that's all I have to work with. What do you want to talk about? What are your best stories? And you can kind of lead the interviewer there, sometimes explicitly. You can say, you know, I worked you know, a ton on re-architecting the way we did, you know, we handled this program. And I'm happy to tell you about that. You know, a lot of interesting stuff. They're happy to tell you a bit about that later on. Very natural then for me to say, sure, yeah, tell me about it. Because I'll take your lead. I want, you, I want to take your lead, actually. I don't want to hear every single detail of everything you've ever done. I want to hear the best stuff. So drive me the direction you want me to do. go. Last thing to think about is hobbies. So hobbies, you know, some interviewers explicitly like to see that you have hobbies outside of work. I wouldn't say that's the norm. But, you know, certainly anything that is relevant you should talk about. So that means anything technical at all, particularly if you don't have a clearly technical background, talk about that. Um, but what you want to think about is anything relevant. So uh, if you've been blogging about, you know, product stuff, yeah, that's relevant. Go talk about that. Uh, but relevant is a lot broader than a lot of people think. So one person I was working with is really passionate about running. That is not particularly relevant to tech companies. They, you know, maybe for very specific companies that are doing, you know, maybe Fitbit, something like that. But for the most part, running is not relevant to tech company. But as it turns out, he had signed up for a 100-mile ultramarathon, which is actually running 100 miles straight. So that's like you run from here down to Palo Alto. Be like, oops, I forgot my laptop. You run back up, literally run back up to San Francisco, and then you run back down, and then run another 10 miles just for fun. Like, that is an insane amount of running. But as it turns out in the actual race, he had quit, he quit around mile 60, because at mile 30, he had hurt his ankle. That, you know, is... Insane, first of all, not, not, probably not medically advisable to run 30 miles, hurt your ankle, and then run another 30 miles. But that, you know, if you think about what you've learned about this guy, you're not going to think, hmm, he's pretty lazy. Well, he'll be able to work really hard here. We need someone who works really hard. I don't know if this guy has it, right? He clearly is a hard worker. He is clearly willing to push past obstacles. He doesn't give up, even when maybe a lot of other people would, even when there's valid justification to give up. That's relevant stuff. So think about your hobbies in that perspective. How do they show creativity? leadership, a drive to learn something new, even if it's something totally crazy and irrelevant. The, just the fact that you were driven to learn something new is a relevant attribute in and of itself. So think about what of your hobbies is actually secretly relevant. The way you make these pitches really great, though, is you, know, you have a story. And a, I would say a small portion of people do this, but they have a story that's really engaging, something that maybe drives them. So that might be, you know, one, one person I was working with, he was really driven by music. He, you know, was studied music. He was, you know, played in a band. And that was, and he was applying for music-related, you know, at a music-related company. And so that was relevant. And that passion for music was really useful. Not only because he's passionate potentially about the job he's applying for, but because along the way, he's probably picked up a lot of other knowledge about music. That was his driving force. Somebody else, you know, what 
she was driven by was connecting with people. So when she was a developer, you could see this in how she was a developer. She mentored a lot of people, and that's actually what drove her into being a product manager because she liked the connection with other people, and she wanted to be able to connect with users, and she found herself driven in that direction. That's, you know, that, that helps your interviewer say, okay, here's the type of person I'm hiring. Yes, I would like somebody who cares about connecting with other, you know, with other coworkers as well as with users. So think about if, you know, if there's a message, something that really drives you throughout your career. The last thing here is addressing your stereotype. So one guy I was working with, this is an acquisition situation. He was... He, had a, he was an artist originally and then went back to school for an HCI, so human-computer interaction uh, degree. And then he went to be a UI designer after that. He then founded this company, this was, which was in the acquisition process, but this was a very, very small company. Um, so it was you know, a two-person, three-person company. That, you know, it, was, it was an acquihire, which means more or less that the company probably isn't doing crazy well. At least in this case, it wasn't. And so it wasn't like, oh, great, you've founded this super successful company. It's like the company's product actually isn't doing that well. And so he was, his company was getting acquired and he was going in, getting slotted into product manager roles. You hear this background, artist, HCI, then UI design, and you look at the actual company's product, which was beautiful, not, didn't have a lot of users, but was beautiful product. And you think, you know, I can see you as a UI designer. Maybe we should re-slot you over there. I don't know if you can really do the data-driven decisions. I don't know if you can really work with developers. You know, I just, you, you see more like somebody who draws pretty pictures. Right? And the, as you work with him on your pitch, it, he was able to totally change it. Where, you know, anybody hearing his background is going to be, it's going to be very, very clear. He's really good at design. But he was able to shape his pitch to start talking a ton about the data-driven decisions he made and the business things. And it totally changed the perspective of him from, you know, maybe you should go be a UI designer too. Wow, this is awesome. We have a PM who can do all the PM stuff and make the business decisions and pour through data to do this. And they also really, really understand design. Isn't that fantastic? And so you want to think about being very realistic about your background and saying, what am I going to assume about you? It's, and what I assume about you is not necessarily based on the truth. It's based on the kinds of things we tend to associate with people who have been a marketer, who've been in customer support, who have been a developer. And you want to make sure you correct those stereotypes. So that goes into also behavioral questions. So standard behavioral question, tell me about a time when you faced a challenge, something like that. You want this, these questions, your answers to, yes, of course, address the question. So if I asked you about a you know, challenge, you should be talking about a challenge, not something totally different. You also want them, and this is where a lot of people actually mess up, you want them to actually not just answer the question, but deliver a positive impression about you. And you can do that, by the way, on any question. Even the questions that are about weaknesses and you know, mistakes and failures, those are not about making your answer as you know, undamaging as possible. Those can absolutely and should be things that develop, you know, that show positive things about you. So you want to deliver a positive message about you. And you also want to be well-structured. And if all else fails, hopefully you can do that last thing. So even if you don't, you know, your answer isn't great content-wise, at least you can deliver a good structure. So <coughs> the first piece about, you know, answering the question is a lot about preparation. So quick way to prepare. Create this little grid here. Leadership, successes, challenges, mistakes, conflicts. And then for every job, try to get one story in there. Now, if you have five jobs, I'm not talking about 25 stories. That's not realistic. But, you know, there's going to be overlap here. But try to get as many different stories as you can. The other way that I found to be really, really, really useful, and I recommend taking both paths here, is pull up a list of strengths and weaknesses online. You can find them online. You can find them in Cracking the PM interview has a copy of, has you know, one, but there's many, many lists of strengths and weaknesses. Pull this up and go through those. What jumps out to you? Are you, you know, risk taker? Are you data driven? Are you very thorough? Are you persistent? Do you have a lot of grit? Which of those things jump out to you as your strengths and also your weaknesses? And then can you find a story that matches that? And what that does is it means that the story you give that, that was elicited from a like, story about, you know, from a new concept of I'm a risk taker is going to obviously demonstrate that quality. So I'm not going to sit there and say, OK, so you had this problem. You did this. What am I learning about you? What I learned about you is going to be probably pretty clear. And this is a really, really, really useful way. It also, you know, whereas this 
strategy tends to get the like huge accomplishment sort of things. This one tends to get the ones that actually deliver clear messages. And it, it ends up getting a lot of stories that you often miss in the first approach. So I, I really recommend taking both though. And by the way, if you have coworkers or friends who you feel like comfortable asking, the question is to ask them also. After you've done this yourself, ask them what they think your strengths and weaknesses are. They might often come up with stories that, you know, this is an exercise I do when I work with companies going through acquisitions is I have them actually sit together and do some of this work. And it's very, very common they come up with stories or strengths and weaknesses that the candidate themselves missed. So once you get the stories out, you want to structure them well. So two, two ways to structure them, and these are really go mostly hand in hand. The first one is what I call nugget first. So tell me about accomplishment you're proud of. Sure, let me tell you about the program I set up to do blank. And what this does is it focuses you on what you're about to say, makes it very clear to yourself that this is what the story is. It's about this program I set up. The other thing that it does is it makes it very clear to me, or, me as an interviewer. So when you say, let me tell you about the time that um, a coworker got frustrated with the way I delivered feedback. When you talk about how your manager assigned you to this task and this and that, and you know, because the CEO had this requirement, I know as an interviewer that this is not about the interaction really with the manager and the CEO and this and that. This is going to be about that coworker. So I can start filtering the information much better and make a lot more sense of your story. So this is a really useful technique to do. The other thing that goes hand in hand with this is what you may have heard about, which is situation, action, result, which is pretty much what it sounds like. What's the situation? What was the action you took? What was the result of that? And do both of these. Give that nugget and then situation, action, result. The other piece here is what's that message? A lot of times someone gives an answer and I'm like, okay, I literally heard the situation, I heard the action result, but I don't feel like I learned anything about you. And they'll say, no, no, no you learned that I did this. Okay, yes, but Give me an adjective. Did I learn that you are a risk taker? Did I learn that you are very thorough? Did I learn that you will push past obstacles? What is the adjective that I've learned about you? And very often these stories kind of fall into mediocre land because there really wasn't a clear message from it. So think about your story. What is that message? So putting these all together, you want to come up with about five stories, at least. If you can do more than that, that's great, but at least five stories. And diagram these. What is that nugget? What is the situation? What was the action? What was the result? What is the message? And then also think about what you would do differently because it's such a common follow-up question. So you should really be ready for that. And it shouldn't be <laughs> nothing, right? Um, you want to have something you would do differently. So the three big mistakes I see people make here. First thing is too little action. So um, someone gives a, you know, example is tell me about a challenge you faced. Sure, and so the person tells me about this time when a, essentially it came down to a supplier was late giving them some materials and that caused X, Y, and Z problem and that caused their stuff to get delayed and then that had you know, ripple effects where they couldn't now get, they couldn't get their product out to the buyers and the buyers had these other problems and blah, right? Huge problem that they talk about. And then, um, so you know, this PM called the, you know, or emailed all the customers, let them know the situation. And at the end, they lost, you know, their one or two of their biggest product, biggest buyers, but they kept a lot of the others. Okay. So the action this person did, what the real story is, they emailed. Cool. Who wouldn't have done that? Right. I, that's, tell me more. Why did you email? One good rule of thumb here is, can you break it down into three bullets for me? Can you say, I took step one, two, and three? Can you say, I took, I considered three options? Can you say, here's what I did, why I did it, and how I did it? Can you break it down? This bulk of your story should focus on the, uh, on the actual action. The other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, it should have a message. This story that I just gave you, what did you learn about the person? I, stressful situation, absolutely. I can see why it would be really stressful. But what did you learn about this PM? That they can use email? That doesn't, that doesn't tell me anything. What tells me something is when they talk about how they actually, they first called, you know, they looked at who the people who'd be most impacted are uh, and prioritized those people first because this was a time sensitive issue. And they, you know, some of these, you know, they got, talked to some of their salespeople, they figured out 
They talk to you know, figure out who do, you know who has the best connection with this person, and figure out what drives this person. So for what are their buyers? What drives this person was you know they really needed that personal connection, and so they want to make sure that the person who reaches out is a person who has a strong personal connection. And even when they reached out to them, when they picked up the phone to call them, they wanted to, they actually let the person know, hey, we're calling you first because we know how important this situation is to you, and let the person know you. Be, semi-explicitly, you are important to us. Another person is really driven by data. And so for that person, they gave them all the background information on here's what was going on, and a lot more information than maybe the person truly needed. And so when you hear from that perspective, you're, th you're learning, this is a person, this is a PM, who will sit down and think methodically about who the, you know, think methodically about what drives other people and will actually tailor solutions to address that need. That's a relevant att attribute for a PM. The third thing, third mistake that people make, is their story is all about we. And it's very, very natural for this to happen to PMs because this is what you're told as a PM. D you know, when it comes, you know, take failures personally, but successes, share them with the team. And this person goes to the interview, and the problem is that I'm interviewing you and not your team. And so the person is all, well, you know, we had this problem, and we looked at a couple different things, and um, we end up, you know, do, doing this, this, and this. And I'm like, great, but wh so what, what piece was you? Well, all of it, really. Or, you know, well, I mean, I was leading it, so all of it, right? And I, I don't have anything to work with here. What I want to know is what you did. And your team is relevant to the extent that your actions impacted them. What, you know, Bobby and Susie arguing about something is irrelevant until you come into the room and, or until it, you know, touches you in some way. So you learned how to address, you know, you talked about how to handle the situation with Bobby and Susie. So you want your story to really focus on yourself. Uh, okay, so let's talk about product design. So uh, there's a couple major types of product design. One of the most common ones is you'll see this alarm clock for the blind. And what people are looking for in these product questions is communication, user empathy, creativity, judgment, and product insight. Now this creativity and judgment thing, this is creativity bounded by judgment. The cool, wacky ideas that you would never ship, those might be creative, but they're not really good PM decisions. So you, you want to balance those things. So let's talk about designing products. So one of the most important steps is, you know, you go through this and you ask questions, you identify users, you discuss use cases, and then you design. This asking questions thing is really, really, really important. You cannot design something if you don't know what you're actually designing for. So that means talk about the user, talk about what they're doing. So if you're designing a bookcase for children, you're really going to want to know what age those children are, right? It, you, and you're going to even want to know, and this is a question that a lot of people forget, where are they using it? Is this a bookcase at home? Is this a bookcase at school, at a library? Where is this? Is this going to be their only bookcase? Because if this, is a compl you know, if, if this isn't the one that needs to store all of their books, that's a different decision. So you want to ask a lot of questions. Make sure that you really know what you're designing for, just like you'd want to in the real world. Second type of question I want to address is favorite products. So never, ever, ever walk into a PM interview without knowing your favorite mobile app, your favorite website, your favorite physical product, your favorite company product. Those are just so, so, so common. So you want to talk about things like, what problem does, a user, does this product solve? What makes th it, this product neat? Why, you know, why do you, it should, and it should, if it's about your favorite product, it should be something that you love. Uh, what, you know, what makes it better than, than the alternatives? If you're telling me that your favorite product is Uber, you better be able to talk about why you like it more than Lyft. And I've heard both those answers so many times, and most people cannot actually answer the question about the alternatives. And then, very often, your interviewer is going to want to know how you would improve it, and so you want to make sure you can address that. So be able to talk about things like, you know, be prepared for on these questions, things like, why do you love it? Who are the other users? Why do they love it? You know, you, they might be used by multiple types of people. What other s stuff do you have about the, the product? What is the competition? What are the alternatives? So yes, the alternative to the direct competition to Uber is Lyft, but the alternatives are buses, cars, taxis, things like that. And what issues are there, both with the product themselves and with the alternatives. Now, where a lot of people mess up here is 
a total lack of insight on this, these questions. So the Uber or Lyft question. So interviewer says, tell me about your favorite product. Sure, my favorite product is, um, you know, or, or tell me about your favorite mobile app. My favorite mobile app is Uber. Okay, why? Well, it's great. You know, I can, it's fantastic. Like wherever I am, I can, you know, just pull my app, press a button, get a car, easier than taxis, don't have to worry about payments, and th that's, all, that's all great. Cool. That's absolutely a cor correct answer. But I could imagine my friend who has no technical skills and no real product skills giving the exact same answer, right? That is the non-techie answer. So yes, you've answered miraculously the cr a good answer, a correct answer to why Uber and Lyft are great products, but you haven't actually done anything to convince me why you would be a great PM. A more insightful answer might go in to talk about how, hey, getting into a car with a stranger is kind of scary, and how they've addressed this trust. What specific steps have, you done, have they done that are kind of ingenious to, to develop trust in the user? And that should go beyond you know, just, well, they have ratings. Uh, what, go into a little bit more. How do they, how do they solve some of these problems? Uh, one answer I get, you know, somebody I interviewed was giving an answer about Snapchat. And this was probably four years ago. So it's a little bit earlier for Snapchat, still mainstream product, but a little bit earlier. And, you know, I've heard answers along these lines. It's like, oh, it's cool. You know, you can send pictures and, you know, you don't, they can't save it. So that's kind of neat. And cool. Um, the non-techie person, the non-PM person is giving the same kind of answer. The answer that went a little bit further was this person talked at this very deep level about how communication in person is different than communication online. We all know it. And it's not just about being able to read people's tone. It's beyond that. It's about people in person are not as sensitive to you know, how they look, what they're saying, all these stuff, because there's a presumption that you're not being recorded, that anything you do is temporary and it goes away and it makes people much less self-conscious. As soon as stuff goes onto text message or starts getting you know, explicitly recorded or whatever, people change how they act. And Snapchat did a much better job of really replicating some in-person, you know, some characteristics of in-person interaction because it's inherently ephemeral. Anything you do goes away. It's just temporary. And people start getting much less sensitive. And that, that language started to get a little bit deeper. It started to make me see this person can think about products at a deeper level. And this is one of the hardest things to do in, these qu in the questions. You want to give an answer that is the answer that a great PM can give about why a product it was really re well done and, so, and in a way that you actually love it, not just it's well done for some other user, but and in a way that you love it. And something that the non-techie person, the person who doesn't really think about products deeply, an answer that they wouldn't really be able to give at that level. What that means is that some products are a lot easier to talk about than others. So very often when people, you know, I've heard people give answers about their favorite product is Reddit. And they have a really hard time delivering that deep answer that talks about users, that talks about what the use cases are for Reddit because people aren't really thinking about the use cases for Reddit. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't get a great answer. Snapchat is also one of the an products I would say is hard to give a great answer for because there aren't as clear use cases. But someone was able to do it. So you absolutely can do it. But you want to think about, you know, is your answer, I is your answer going to show that you have those PM skills? Is it going to show that you understand users, that you understand use cases? Because that's what you really want your answer to be able to do. Thank you.